Good evening, uh, directors. Welcome to the Wednesday, June 17th uh, Board of Directors meeting for Dr. Cog. I am calling to order the meeting at 6.30. Uh, the second item is roll call and introduction of new members and alternates. Uh, tonight, I'm told we have a new member, uh, Josie Cockrell of the town of Foxfield. Josie, thank you very much for, uh, for your attendance. And with that, uh, Ms. Stevens, can you please um, do roll call? All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. I will now go ahead and unmute all uh, members and alternates. Okay, and now people should be able, you may be self-muted, so just make sure that you're able to unmute yourself on your end, and anyone on the phones, please hit star six. Okay, here we go. Uh, Eva Henry. <coughs> Steve D. O. D. Oricio. Jeff Baker. Here. Elise Jones. William Lindstedt. Here. Randy Wheelock. George Marlin. Nicholas Williams. Here. Kevin Flynn. Here. Roger Partridge. Here. Ron Angles. Libby Zabo. Here. Bob Pfeiffer. John Marriott. Mike Kaufman. Here. Larry Vidham. David Spellman. Aaron Brockett. Present. Margo Ramsden. Adam Cushing. Present. Roger Hudson. Deborah Mulvey. George Teal. Jason Gray. Tammy Maurer, Mike Sutherland, <clears throat> Jeremy Fay, Randy Wheel, here, Richard Champion, Dale Christie, Nicole Frank, present, Catherine Whitman, here, Steve Conklin, here, Linda Olson, present, Bill Gipp. Linda Montoya, Celeste Arner, Drew Peterson, Bobby Sindelar, Josie Cockrell, present, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey, Keith Holmes, Rachel Binkley, present, Jim Dale, Paul Hassman, George Lance, Dave Kerber, Mike Hillman, Stephanie Walton, Tim Barnes, Jacob LeBure, Isaac Levy, Karina Elron, Pamela Grove, Larry Strock, President, Wynn Shaw, Present. Joan Tech. <laughs> Ashley Stolzman. Here. Connie Sullivan. Barney Drysat. Joyce Palzuski. Colleen Whitlow. Present. Paul Sutton. Sean Foray. Chris Larson. Julie. Julie Duran Mullica, Joyce Downing, Sally Daigle, here, Sandy Hammerly, here, Jessica Sandgren, here, Herb Atchison, Anita Seitz, Bud Starker, present, Adam Zarin, Rebecca White, Bill Van Meter. Okay, and uh, obviously if you didn't think that your name was heard or anyone on the phones, uh, any directors or alternates, if you want to state your name for the record. Jim Dale. Elise, Elise Jones is on. Jim Lynette, Dale. Lynette Kelsey. 
Heidi Hinkle Broomfield. Bill Van Meter. Okay. Melinda, this yes. is Doug. Um, Eva Henry is also in the line. She's, she's having some audio. Okay, Eva, it looks like, uh, I mean, you should be able to speak if need be. Uh, right. I can now, yes. Now I'm unmuted. So, yes, I'm here. All right, perfect. And then I also see Stephanie Walton. Yes, sure. hi. Perfect. Okay. All right. Uh, obviously, if for some reason you didn't hear your name or you weren't able to speak at this time, uh, you can email me, mstevens at drcog.org, and I'll make sure that you're added for the record. And with that, Mr. Chair, we do have a quorum. Great. Uh, thank you, Ms. Stevens. Uh, the next item is approval of the agenda. Um, with this, I would like to have somebody uh, use the raised hand icon so I can get a motion, please. All right. It looks like we have a hand raise from uh, Director Flynn. Director Flynn, go ahead. Uh, yes, thank you. I move that uh, the uh, agenda be approved. Thank you, Director Flynn. Uh, do I have a second? Please use the raise I mean, hand. I think it's technically supposed to be mm -hmm. things that talk to you but okay, it looks like we have some. Uh, it looks like our second hand was actually from Jessica Sandgren. So, uh, Director Sandgren, go ahead. I second the motion to approve the minutes or the agenda, sorry. Thank you very much, Director Sandgren. Uh, and with that, uh, we're going to have our first vote of the night. Uh, all in favor, say aye. 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 Against. Abstain. Motion carries. Thank you, everybody. The next uh, the next section of the agenda is the public hearing, item four. Public hearing on a proposed technical amendment to the 2040 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. And with that, I have prepared a narrative here to read into the record. Uh, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. I'm John Dyack, Chair of the Denver Regional Council of Governments Board of Directors. I thank you all for participating tonight. This evening, the Denver Regional Council of Governments is holding a public hearing on a proposed technical amendment to the 2040 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan and associated air quality conformity documents. This public hearing of the Denver Regional Council of Governments is hereby convened. The purpose of this hearing is to provide an opportunity for all who are interested in the documents I just noted to provide comments to the board. No decisions will be made and no actions will be taken tonight related to this public hearing. Receiving public comment is important to the board's decision-making process. Anyone wishing to speak should raise your hand using the GoToWebinar interface or by typing your name in the question box. If you've joined by phone, we will open the phone line shortly to allow you to speak. All comments received via email, Dr. Cog website, or in writing have been automatically included in the public record. Comments received prior to this public hearing have been provided to the board. <clears throat> if you wish to submit written testimony to be included in the official record of the public hearing, please email it to the secretary after you speak. Board members are free to ask questions of those testifying. Jacob Rieger of Dr. Cox staff will now summarize the proposed amendment. Mr. Rieger. Thank you, Mr. Chair or members of the board. Uh, this is Jacob Rieger, manager of long range transportation planning here at Dr. Cog. So the subject of tonight's amendment to the 2040 MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan, this is our adopted plan. The subject of tonight's amendment is a single project that you should see on your screen. Um, this involves the widening of uh, the E-470 main line from Quincy Avenue to I-70. Um, this project is to widen the section of roadway from uh, four lanes to six lanes. This project is already in our adopted 2040 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan, um, but as indicated on the screen, the topic of the proposed amendment is that because this project is opening sooner than originally anticipated and currently reflected in the plan, um, we, need to, we need to change the way that this project is portrayed in the Regional Transportation Plan. Um, the way that we do that, as indicated on the screen, is by um, changing it's what we call its air quality staging period. Right now, it's in our 2030 to 2040 staging period already in the plan. Uh, we also need to add it to our 2020 to 2029 staging period. Uh, that really is the topic of the proposed amendment. 
by making this change, what we're really saying is that we're reflecting when this project is, is going to open. Uh, we have it in the correct air quality conformity staging periods. Um, that is a federal requirement uh, that we do air quality conformity on uh, the amended plan. So it's not on this individual project, but it is for the overall plan. Um, so because we're adding this project to an additional staging period, we did rerun air quality conformity for that staging period. Um, again, that's a federal requirement. We do that to make sure that the plan as amended uh, continues to meet or not exceed uh, the motor vehicle emissions budgets uh, for those staging periods that are specified uh, for the planning process in the state implementation plan for air quality. Part of the documentation of this proposed amendment um, are those air quality conformity documents that demonstrate um, that with this change to this proposed project, the plan as amended continues to meet all emissions budgets for air quality conformity. Um, this public hearing uh, is a capstone of a 30-day public comment period. Um, during the public comment period, we did receive one set of comments from Boulder County. Um, those comments are available to you in the handouts um, section of the uh, GoToWebinar interface. Uh, we're not responding to those comments tonight. As was indicated, we are in a we're in an input gathering mode tonight, but we will document those comments and respond to them, and that will be part of uh, the documentation that we bring to the board um, at a future meeting when we ask you to approve uh, the amended plan uh, with this proposed change. Um, that's all I have, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Rieger. The hearing is now open for those who have signed up to speak. Each speaker will have up to three minutes to testify. If you have not finished by the end of three minutes, I will ask you to conclude your remarks. We respectfully ask that you not repeat specific points made by prior speakers. A simple statement of agreement with prior testimony is acceptable and appreciated. Ms. Stevens, let's first open the phone lines and see if there's anyone who is joined by phone who wishes to speak to this item. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and all microphones should be open. Is there anybody who would like to speak to this, please, on the, on the phone? Hearing none, I will uh, close the phone portion of this. Uh, is there anyone who has raised their hands or noted in the question box that they would like to speak? Chair Dyack, I'm not seeing, oh, I see one hand raised. Um, one second. Oh, and the hand went back down. <laughs> Might've been an accident. I'm not seeing any, oh, and there's one back up. Elise so Jones, our director this, Jones. Sorry, I wasn't sure if it was me or somebody else. I just wanted to um, take a moment to say Boulder County did submit comments. They weren't really specific to the particular project. It was more towards um, the issues that I've raised with uh, about air quality conformity in the past, which is we are uh, significantly increasing vehicle miles traveled in the metro area, and we are in serious non-attainment for ozone and likely to hit severe non-attainment next year. And yet the air quality conformity process doesn't actually um, really influence um, significantly uh, transportation uh, capacity projects or move us towards decreasing VMT, which isn't that we're not applying it properly or that staff aren't doing the job. It's that the, the air quality conformity process um, continues uh, uh, to set budgets that don't decline um, over the years so as to drive a decrease in VMT and help us uh, do transportation planning that actually improves air quality. And this is something that was brought up at the Air Quality Control Commission hearing or um, retreat today. And it's something that came up um, at the Air Quality Control Commission's meeting with the Transportation Commission last year and is likely to be something that's addressed so that in the future, air quality conformity actually helps, is a process that helps us increase um, compliance with the Clean Air Act and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So I just wanted to make that comment. Thank you, Director Jones. Uh, are there any other questions from the board? Ms. 
Ms. Hood? I'm not seeing any raised hands or any questions in the question box, Chair. Thank you very much. We will conclude this portion. Uh, this brings uh, tonight's public hearing to a close at uh, 6.45 p.m. Thank you for your testimony and your interest. All right, uh, next item, report of the chair. Um, I had a couple of Dr. Cog related items. I gave tests or, I'm sorry, public comment for the Transportation Committee in support of our uh, Urban Arterials Multimodal Safety Improvement Set-Aside Program. Speaking with Executive Director Rex, um, we believe uh, it has been approved and uh, tracking for an early June um, disclosure. Uh, I also uh, provided opening comments to the Dr. Cog planning certification meeting. Uh, Director Papstorf, it, it sounds like uh, we are on track uh, to have a successful certification review. I also uh, attended the CDOT Region 4 Dr. Cog Communities quarterly meeting. And uh, that is the end of my report. The next item is report on performance and engagement committee. Um, please, um, Director Flynn. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. Uh, the uh, performance engagement committee met on June 3rd, uh, virtually, uh, as we are meeting now. And our first order of business was to elect a vice chair. We elected Director Atchison from Westminster. Uh, we discussed the uh, ongoing, uh, the uh, uh, collaboration assessment from the board directors. Uh, we authorized that to go out and you all should have received email from Jerry Stigel. It takes just under about 10 minutes to do uh, this survey. We need you to complete it. We have about another week. Uh, this weekend would be a good time to do it perhaps. Uh, we only have about a dozen responses right now. And so please take the time about 10 minutes to uh, do it. If you don't have a link, uh, please email Jerry, uh, Jerry Stigel at uh, Dr. Cog and he can send you the link. We had a pretty lengthy discussion of the 2020 Vision Awards celebration that uh, we had to postpone this spring. And uh, the staff presented us with a really robust menu of options. Uh, most of us uh, started to gather around the option of delaying it until spring 2021. There's a couple of reasons for that, although we had some reasonable uh, uh, alternatives for the fall. The feeling was that it would be difficult to gather, uh, collect uh, pledges or sponsorships from our uh, from supporters, from corporations, from other associations, given the uh, financial uh, atmosphere in which we find ourselves right now. So that would have been a challenge. Uh, there was also the possibility that even if large gatherings are permitted uh, in the fall in September, that people might be reluctant to get together, uh, uh, not knowing what, what the situation will actually be like. Uh, we actually recommended that we don't officially cancel the date at Empower Field until the drop dead date in July, just so that we can keep our options open until then. Uh, the, uh, we also discussed uh, among those other options, a live virtual event, uh, hosting several smaller in-person celebrations for the separate categories and uh, perhaps doing a small scale recorded recognition of the winners. Uh, but as I said, the, the predominant opinion was that our desire to get together personally to celebrate uh, these, these awards really trumped the desire to do something more immediate. So we ended up uh, recommending waiting until spring 2021. We also discussed whether to combine these awardees uh, from this year with the winners from this year that we'd celebrate next year. We didn't come up with a specific recommendation, uh, but uh, we did note that staff thought there might be a challenge in putting on two separate award celebrations in calendar 2021. So we still have some uh, discussion to do there. Uh, there's plenty of pros and cons, and we will we'll return to discussing that at the next, uh, next opportunity. The final thing was the discussion of the 2020 board workshop. And uh, again, no resolution uh, other than uh, perhaps uh, looking at a casual get together in town later this year, perhaps using the outdoor space at our building, the new space that was built up on the uh, the upper level, the outdoor level. And that's my report, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you, Director Flynn. Uh, next item report on Finance and Budget Committee, Director Conklin. 
Great, thank you very much. The Finance and Budget Committee met earlier this evening to hear presentations on seven different resolutions from Dr. Cox's staff. Uh, thank you to the staff for their briefings and the work on the items. Also, thanks to committee members for their active participation. All of the items were approved unanimously by the committee. These included resolutions authorizing the executive director to do things such as uh, reassign human service tr transportation set-aside agreements with the Senior Resource Center, and also negotiate and execute a contract with the DM Mobility Service for up to $1.2 million. Uh, those two items helping fill the void left when C SRC stops with their transportation on July 1st. Uh, also authorized uh, the executive director to negotiate and execute contracts with CDOT to carry out the Dr. Cog Way to Go Regional Transportation Demand Management Programs uh, in this fiscal year and the next fiscal year, or actually FY 2020 and FY 2021, uh, issued contracts with service providers in the amount of uh, $450,000 for the AAA Transportation Voucher Program and $400,000 for the AAA In-Home Voucher Program. Also negotiate and execute a contract with Tool Design Group, LLC, in an amount not to exceed $150,000 to develop a regional complete streets toolkit we also authorize the executive director to negotiate and execute a contract with RTD to reimburse RTD for certain reimagined RTD tasks in the Unified Planning Group Program using uh, group funds of $144,000 plus. And finally, we authorize the exec executive director to negotiate and execute a revenue agreement with the Regional Transportation District to house staff and facilitate the RTD Accountability Committee in an amount of up to $200,000 a year. So it was a very busy meeting. And that is my report. Thank you, Director Conklin. And the next item, report of the Executive Director. Executive Director Rex, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and good evening, everyone. I hope every hope you and your families are safe and healthy. Um, just a COVID update from Dr. Cox's perspective. Uh, we have extended our mandatory teleworking arrangement through July 12th. Um, of course, safety remains um, our, our number one consideration as we uh, transition back to the office and we have developed in part a transition plan and we do anticipate moving into phase one of that office transition pan, uh, plan pending other developments on uh, July 13th. Um, the first phase will be a voluntary phase and and um, and staff will be divided into a couple, uh, couple groups um, and the groups will be allowed to uh, come into the office on four consecutive days. So the first group, for example, Will be, will be permitted to come into the office on July 13th or the 16th. And then uh, the second group will come in the following week from Ju July 20th through the 23rd and so on until we have uh, confidence to enter the, the second phase. Where we um, we kind of like this approach. It's, it's going to give us enough information and data that we can make sure it's kind of a pilot stage for us to make sure that we have the, the, the uh, proper uh, provisions and protocols in place for when we uh, bring staff back in a more more elaborate matter so um i would like to just expand on a couple of the items that director conklin reported on in his finance and budget committee remarks um the first i would like to talk about is the rtd accountability committee and i sent an email out to the board about this initiative um last week just to give you guys our heads up because as things things seem seem to do this initiative um is fast moving um I, you know, many of you may recall that uh, during the legislative session, uh, Senate Bill 151 was introduced, um, and the, the the real purpose of the bill was to modify the Regional Transportation District Act to um, <clears throat> to provide a, additional direction and oversight to RTD. Well, one of the one of the provisions of that bill was the establishment of an accountability committee to perform a comprehensive review of the many facets associated with uh, delivering transit service in the Denver region. Well, of course, COVID-19 COVID hits and, uh, and 151 was postponed indefinitely. However, over the last month or so, RTD, House and Senate Transportation Chairs and Governor Post's office have been working to develop a proposal that would create a RTD Accountability Committee outside of the legislative process. And the, um, I know for a fact the one thing that they all agreed on right from the outset that this, this, uh, this process had to be independent. And, um, and, and as a result, they reached out to us here at Dr. Cog and asked if we had any interest in housing, um, staffing, and facilitating the, um, this, this accountability committee. 
And we gave it a lot of thought, uh, myself and Ron Papsdorf and Rich Morrow, as well as others. Um, we talked about it and, and you really, it's, it's, it's really up our alley, right? I mean, it's the type of work that we do with regards to collaboration and facilitation and all that kind of good stuff. So we really felt comfortable from that perspective. We also know that, um, you know, the success of RTD is very important to our long-term mobility goals. And um, so as a result, we uh, felt very comfortable with, um, um, you know, accepting this, this role. And, um, and quite frankly, we were, um, we were pleased that, the, that the, the three partners have confidence in us to do this. And uh, I'm sure we'll do a bang up job. Um, the other I wanted to mention was the S SRC, the VIA transfer. So um, we've been keeping the board updated over the last couple of months about the issues and ultimately seniors resource centers decision to cease transportation service operations by July 1st. Um, so our staff, so Dr. Cox staff really in two divisions have been feverishly working with many of our regional stakeholders and partners. And I'm delighted to report this evening that uh, VIA has agreed to take over most of those transportation services currently offered by SRC. Um, some of you are, uh, may be familiar with VIA. They, they have a good presence in the Northwest part of our region um, for many years. And I know uh, they also offer services, I believe in Eastern Arapahoe and, um, and Adams County as well. So we, um, you know, we, we feel really comfortable with VIA. Um, I, and um, um, you know they've been tremendous to work with um, during during this short period of time that we've had the opportunity. And I don't want to belabor the point, um, but I'm so appreciative of the great work everyone is, it, associated with this project has done. Um, quite frankly, I think they've moved mountains in order to get here today. I, it was unbelievable the number of meetings and the outreach. I mean, you can imagine a, um, a project this size moving this quickly, just the inter intricacies of that. But I would like to give a special thanks to our, our, our transportation planning and operations staff, Ron Papsdorf and, and uh, Matthew Helfand for all the work that they've done, as well as um, uh, staff members on our AAA side, Travis Noon and Sharon Day. So thank you all very much. And also big thank you to VIA. Um, they've been tremendous, as I mentioned. Um, Frank Bruno, the CEO, as well as Bill Patterson, who's kind of their operations guy, I've just, just Tremendous. Uh, I, got, I got nothing but good things to say, so I'll, I'll just leave it there. Um, so I mentioned this this next initiative um, in my last monthly newsletter, uh, Telework Tomorrow. Um, our Way to Go team have launched a new campaign um, here fairly recently. So during the um, stay at home and safer at home orders, as you know, many people began teleworking nearly every day. Um, way to go, our, our team conducted employer and commuter surveys to determine that in large part this was a positive experience and that many organizations plan to continue telework practices even beyond COVID-19. So with, you know, with that kind of knowledge, and it made a lot of sense, um, our way to go team has gathered a lot of resources, trained our outreach teams and redesigned all of their materials and website to actively promote uh, continued teleworking. Um, so if your jurisdiction or, or any other large employer you may know of uh, would like to learn more about this, this initiative, simply reach out to myself or Steve Erickson, who's our communications and marketing uh, director, or you're more than welcome, of course, to go to uh, our waytogo.org website. Um, kind of related to that topic, um, the, last Thursday, Governor Polis announced a new initiative to help local communities and businesses safely reopen the economy. And uh, Dr. Cog's telework tomorrow is very prominent element of this multifaceted initiative. Um, in, so there are cer certain grant opportunities that are available to your communities. Details are, are still being finalized, but grants will include um, such things as a street, streetscape challenge. CDOT will be awarding grants to uh, revitalize main streets, uh, a safe and flexible communities challenge, Again, CDOT will provide micro grants to help encourage telework best practices as well as other things. And the Colorado Energy Office will be supporting a pilot program to provide e-bike and scooter access to essential workers. Um, and again, details are still being worked out on this and we'll be, we'll be sure to pass along um, more information as it becomes available. Uh, we also have an upcoming MetroVision Idea Exchange kind of on the, the same topic of uh, full-time remote 
of workforce and teleworking and all that kind of good stuff. So on June 24th, um, we'll be uh, hosting that webinar and we'll highlight the findings from the recent survey that I just mentioned um, that we did with human resources representatives representing countries from around the region and state and on uh, strategies for future efforts and resources to support teleworking. Um, everything you need to know to register for the event can be found on Dr. Cog's event calendar. Um, so we hope you or your staff will uh, will be will be able to join us and share your perspective. Um, second to last thing I wanted to just mention to you is related to our 2050 small area forecasts, which are used to um, as inputs into our our travel demand forecasting model, which we predict future mobility and traffic in, within our region. Um, your staffs have been been busy providing feedback on on our, our draft small area forecast. In total, we received over 600 individual comments from 28 jurisdictions and are now in the process of incorporating that feedback to finalize our shared set of regional planning assumptions um, that will be used by ourselves in our planning process, as I mentioned, but also by RTD in their reimagine um, initiative. Over the past few years, um, we've invested in a lot of tools um, and data to help integrate local planning and, and zoning assumptions um, into our efforts for future distribution of household and employment throughout the region. But in reality, there's there's no substitute for the local review and feedback. So I I want to give you know your staffs so just a big shout out for for all the work that they have done to help us and get into ultimately the best the best um, product that we can um, because you know as you all know the saying is it's garbage in garbage out right. So it's important that we have um, very strong inputs to feed our travel demand forecasting tool. And lastly, just just, just a personal note, um, I got an email from Director Atchison last week that he wouldn't be at our meeting this evening, um, but he had a good reason. He and his wife, Erica, um, are celebrating their 53rd wedding anniversary tonight. So I thought that was fabulous, and I, just, I, I didn't ask him if I could share it, and I don't care. I want, <laughs> I'm going ahead and sharing it with you guys. And um, so if you get an opportunity, I'm I'm sure he would appreciate if you send him a quick text or something and just congratulate him on that. And if nothing else, reach out to Erica. And I think that woman should be, if she, 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 she should be up for sainthood <laughs> her for, for 53 years, but it's fantastic. I'm, and um, I'm real happy for them both. Mr. Chairman, that is my report. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Executive Director Rex. Uh, the next item uh, on the agenda, public comment. Up to 45 minutes is allocated now for public comment. And each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests from the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting. public comment. The chair requests that there be no public comment on issues for which a prior public hearing has been held before this board. Consent and action items will begin immediately after the last speaker. And at 7.03, we will open public comment. Ms. Stevens, uh, is there anybody to address the board? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I have opened up the microphone, so I'll make sure that there is nobody on the phones first. If there's anyone on the phones for public comment, please hit star six now and state your name. Okay, uh, I am not seeing anyone, or I'm not hearing anyone on the phones. Uh, we do have a hand raise. It looks like it is from uh, Randall Loeb. Randall, you will have three minutes to make your comment, and then uh, if you exceed three minutes, I will let you know when to make your closing statement. Uh, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thank you for allowing me to speak to you for a second. Uh, I've been an advocate for many, many years, involved with many different aspects of Dr. Cog. I'm uh, proud to participate. I'm involved in the regional planning for transportation. One of our uh, thoughts is that it be free uh, just like Kansas City, I think you should work on that diligently for the foreseeable future. We expect the number of homeless people uh, regionally uh, to double in the next uh, period of time due to the millions of people who are unemployed and the seriousness of the inability of families and people to meet their obligations for rent, mortgages, uh, and to take care of themselves. Uh, more importantly than all of that is the quality of life, which I keep on stressing every time I get a chance. 
I'm very much interested, which is why I participate in Dr. Cog in us working together. I really want to uplift the essential workers, our police, our public servants for what they have uh, seriously offered their lives for. I'm a poll worker at Blair Caldwell Library for the Denver Election Commission for the, new, the primary. And I feel it's essential for us to have public servants who will not compromise participating in this republic to take care of people. That said, the numbers of people who are living on the streets, the way in which it looks like the Mission District in LA is ridiculous. We need to come up with strategies, my friends and colleagues, for housing us all. And that includes myself. I've been down that road many years. And I do believe we have a right to housing for all as much as we do to transportation. I hope someday you allow me to take an hour of a MetroVision idea exchange and express how much these matters have been developed in places like Helsinki and Finland to make sure that every person who lives in that vicinity, whether they be documented or not, has a right to a place to stay permanently and the support of services to keep them housed. Thank you for allowing me to speak to you and I hope that you will follow up with me in any way, shape and form because I am uh, your a friend and advocate for what you do. A staff of this organization, I cherish in my life. Thank you, Mr. Loeb, and thank you for your commitment to uh, coming before this board uh, year in and year out. Uh, Ms. Stevens, is there anybody else for public comment? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, at this time, I am not seeing any other hands raised. Thank you so much. We will close public comment at 7.07. Uh, next part of the agenda is the consent agenda, item eight. Um, if, there is, if there are no questions or comments on the uh, consent agenda, please, uh, anyone who would like to make a motion to approve the consent agenda, please raise your, your electronic hand and Ms. Stevens will call upon you. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just waiting for any hands raised at this time. Okay, looks like our first hand went up from uh, Kevin Flynn. So, M Director Flynn. Uh, thank you, Melinda. Mr. Chair, I move that we approve the consent agenda. Thank you, Director Flynn. Uh, do we have a second? If we have a second, please raise the electronic hand and Ms. Stevens will call upon you. Thank you. It looks second. like. Oh, and who was that, please, for the record? Tammy Mauer. Thank Tammy you, Ms. Mauer. Mauer for the second. Right. We appreciate that. So we have a first from Director Flynn, a second from Director Mauer. All of those in favor, please say aye. 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 Against? Abstain? Thank you, everybody. Motion carries. Next part of the agenda is the informational briefings. Uh, item nine, briefing on legislative updates. Mr. Morrow, please. Thank you. Am I unmuted? <laughs> you are. All right, very good. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and, and uh, directors. Uh, I'm going to just do a, a short overview uh, or wrap up on the legislative session. And I hope that we have uh, our Dr. Cog lobbyists, Ed Bowditch and Jennifer Castle on. Um, if they're not, they should be coming on shortly uh, to help me. Uh, but uh, I'll start by saying, needless to say, it was a uh, wild and crazy, unpredictable, any exclamation you can think of uh, session, um, having been suspended after, I think, 60 some days back in March, and um, then having to deal with uh, uh, another word everybody's been using, unprecedented uh, budget shortfall. Uh, it was quite a ride. Uh, I, I had at times started to describe it to, to people I talked to as a roller coaster ride, but then I realized that roller coasters always have some ups to go with the downs. And as far as the budget concerned, it was pretty much all down. 
Um, as I'm sure you've all heard about the $3.3 billion hole that they had to fill. And um, it was pretty remarkable listening into those hearings and at times having to communicate with JBC members, um, particularly about uh, the aging funding programs. We were very concerned uh, about uh, those, uh, the funding for the area agencies on aging um, having to be cut because uh, they were having to um, do that on a number of programs in order to get to the number they needed to reach. Um, but we were able to work with members in the JBC and the staff to um, spare the uh, AAA funding. Uh, it ended up with flat funding as far as their appropriation and their operating budgets. However, we did not avoid um, uh, what I'll call a, a sweep of our cash fund, which was another thing that they did a lot to try to fill the budget hole was uh, take uh, portions, usually large portions of balances in various cash funds. And in our case, the older Coloradans cash fund uh, had uh, $18 million uh, taken from us uh, to uh, help balance the general fund. Um, so that was sad. We had a lot of ideas on how to spend that money and had actually had an agreement with the governor's office uh, on how to do that right at the time everything started shutting down. So, uh, but with that, uh, I think I note in the memo, uh, one silver lining is all involved that recognize the need to really take a serious look at what I call long-term stable, just sustainable funding for the triple A's. And so that's gonna be something that we're going to be working on with all of our partners uh, over the coming months. And uh, you may hear more about that uh, later in the year. Um, there was also uh, uh, transportation uh, actually was able to, let's say, contribute to helping in balancing. And I've got a paragraph kind of summarizing that uh, with, uh, and, and, I, and I would note that um, you know, my impression in listening to the discussions, the JBC and its staff worked really closely with the governor's office and CDOT in figuring out um, exactly what they could do and how much uh, that would uh, take. And I know part of it was the uh, $50 million um, uh, amount that's transferred by statute to the general fund and um, that that was taken for two years. Uh, they moved some money around from the bonding in, in Senate Bill 267. I uh, got rid of that uh, ballot measure that that called for later this year as well. Um, so uh, they also had, whew, I think the way they said 43 bills to go along with the long bill to help implement all the various things, implement the various things they had to do, which was an, uh, a record for uh, companion bills, uh, which added to the workload for the legislature when they came back on May 26th. Um, and uh, I was actually surprised that they took up as many bills as they did. Uh, there was a lot of talk I had been hearing before that they were really going to do, since it was only going to be a two or three, two, I think initially a two-week session, it ended up being a three-week session, um, that they were going to really uh, lay over, you know, basically kill a whole bunch of bills and only focus on some priorities in the budget. That did get expanded by the time they introduced, uh, or, uh, started up, and so uh, in addition to the budget, they had a number of COVID-related bills to implement COVID funding. Uh, they had, an, an, um, uh, uh, in terms of Dr. Cog's interest, uh, they had um, the, a number of housing bills um, that uh, actually passed, including uh, two mobile home park bills and uh, some money for eviction defense and uh, what they call a source of income bill that passed. Uh, there were, however, others that, that, that did fail. Uh, just as in the transportation area, um, the uh, 
that regional transportation authority bill, House Bill 1151 that we had had an interest in at the beginning of the session, uh, obviously was uh, um, put on the shelf. And boy, doesn't that seem like a long time ago that we were discussing all that. Um, but that's a um, uh, just a very quick overview uh, of uh, the session. There was the, they're going to come back on January 13th of 2021 um, and probably face even more challenges. Uh, but with that, I'll stop and see if there are questions and also see if Ed and Jen are on and able to uh, make a, a couple of more comments on uh, the session and uh, what, what to look forward to in coming months, particularly related to the budget. Thank Rich, you. Uh, thank you. This is Ed Bowditch and uh, Jen is on as well. Um, just uh, to support what Rich's um, overview covered, the budget was really unprecedented. Everywhere they could cut, they did cut. Um, a budget shortfall of the magnitude of $3.3 billion was huge. Um, the budget committee started meeting in, in late April and went through everything. We were very pleased, uh, Jen and, and Rich and I, that in the end, the state funding for seniors was held flat. Now, we've got a, a bunch of one-time funds that are propping that up, so we'll have to worry about next year. But for this year, I mean, they cut K-12, they cut higher ed by 58% of state funding for higher ed is just gone. They cut child welfare, but they held state funding for senior services flat, so we were very pleased. Um, the other thing I wanted to mention, it kind of surprised a lot of us, there was no change in the senior uh, homestead exemption. Um, we thought that might be suspended as it had been in previous downturns, but there was no bill introduced to do that. So that lives on at least for one more year. Um, we'll get more guidance. The next step in, in the budget process, even though the legislature is gone, is this Friday. We'll get the next quarterly revenue estimate so that will give us a, a more in-depth look at where the budget is, what's been happening, um, and that sort of thing, employment levels. So I will, uh, Jennifer and I will prepare a memo, send it to Rich, and he can distribute that based on Friday's information. And hello all, this is Jen Castle. So in addition to what Ed and Rich mentioned, um, to, to try to help with some of the state's budget woes, um, the voters are going to decide on certain tax policies this November. We have two referred measures from the legislature from the legislature, excuse me. The first one is to repeal the Gallagher Amendment. Um, that was a bipartisan partisan effort that passed both chambers with two third majorities. Um, we will also see an increase in cigarette tax and also a new tax on vaping products that's projected to raise 82 million this year in fiscal year 2021, 167 million in 21-22. Those revenues will go to rural schools, preschool, and tobacco education programs. There's also one initiative that we are expecting. It hasn't been approved for the ballot yet, but we are expecting that it will make it through the process, and that is a graduated income tax. So that will remove the flat income tax that we have currently and replace it with uh, four different tiers um, of, of a tax rate based on your income. The first, the first tier is anything from, goes up into 250,000 and that would actually see a reduction in your tax rate. Everything else up to 1 million, you will see an increase. That initiative is supposed to generate roughly $2 billion Half of that will go to education, and the other half is supposed to go to impacts from our growing economy. That could be transportation, that could be healthcare, et cetera, those types of things. So those are three things that we will certainly see on the ballot um, that have to do with tax policy, fiscal policy, and to try to help uh, the state budget. And that's our uh, report, Mr. Chair, to see if there are any questions. Thank you, Mr. Morrow. Uh, with that, board members, uh, if you have any questions for our uh, triumvirate, please raise your electronic hand and Ms. Stevens will call on you. 
All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll give everyone just a moment to get any hands raised if need be. All right, at this time, I am not seeing any hands raised. Thank you very thank much. You. Yes. All right, uh, continuing on, item 10, uh, briefing on the status of RTD Fast Tracks projects. Director Van Meter. Thank you for the introduction. To show my screen. And that will allow me to run through a brief presentation. Is it working? It is. Awesome. Thank you. So, this is the 2020 Fast Tracks annual status report. Um, many members will recall that that was part of the Dr. Cog resolution pursuant to Senate Bill 208 back in 2004 approving fast tracks and that was that RTD is to submit an annual report on progress or status of uh, fast tracks to Dr. Cog um, so we've been doing that um, for many years now this report includes status of, of the Fast Tracks projects, some Fast Tracks financial information, um, additional information, um, even beyond Fast Tracks uh, this year, because there are so many different things happening within um, RTD that are of interest to the Dr. Cog board. This investment map shows th those corridors that existed prior to Fast Tracks in gray. It shows the completed projects in fast in fast tracks to date in purple. It shows the end line scheduled for opening and operations in September of this year. And it identifies the four projects that RTD has not been able to identify funding for. In another format, it's the same projects listed in this table along with the opening dates for your information and the levels of investment on each of the projects and corridors in um, the fast tracks program uh, presented in this table both spent through 2019 and the total project budgets for all those projects few updates um, regarding bus service levels, as identified in the original Fast Tracks plan, RTD's intent was to increase rubber tire funding using Fast Tracks funds at the rate of about 1% per year um, from initiation of the plan through 2020. From 2006 through 2013, that funding at 1% a year did indeed go to the fast tracks or to rubber tired service from fast tracks sales and use tax funds. But in 2020, in 2012, I'm sorry, the RTD board capped funding at 2013 levels. Um, those levels now increase just at the rate of inflation uh, to cover the costs of that level of rubber tired service. So the intended subsequent annual increases have not occurred. Still, in 2019, almost $19 million was provided from Fast Tracks funding to operate that increased bus service, even with the cap. Uh, those, the, the, that was a quick brief rundown on the status of Fast Tracks. Uh, some other updates in terms of RTD leadership. This board is well aware that uh, general manager, then general manager, David Genova announced his retirement in late 2019 and retired in January of 2020. Paul Ballard was selected by the RTD Board of Directors and appointed as the interim CEO GM in January. Search for a permanent CEO and GM is underway and the intent is to be able to announce that selection in the fall of this year. Um, folks are also very much aware of the struggles that RTD was experiencing 
with our um, transit operators, with our bus operators and our rail operators in maintaining headcount and staffing levels required to provide the service that we had budgeted and scheduled uh, through 2019 and into the early months of 2020, causing much consternation internally and much trials for our passengers and frankly for our personnel, for our operators, for our staff who were being mandated to work overtime on a, a very frequent and uh, high, by, high basis. We had our, our, our board of directors on March 24th, 4th had adopted a service plan to help address those driver shortage issues and service issues by um, modest decrease in the levels of transit service to be provided that was to go into effect on May 17th to help address those issues. Then the world changed or was changing concurrently. Um, and that service plan was supplanted by COVID-19 service which is about a 60% level of our typical weekday service prior to the pandemic. So a 40% drop in service or a 60% level of service compared to pre-pandemic levels. That was in response to a reduction in ridership of actually close to 70% due to COVID-19. That COVID-19 service plan was implemented in mid-April, April 19th of this year. It re remains in place. Additionally, RTD um, instituted a number of other safety efforts for our operators and importantly for our passengers, intensified cleaning of our vehicles. We suspended fare collection. We have subsequently announced that we will reinstate fare collection on July 1st of this year but for the time being from that date through july 1st fares collection has been suspended and rear boarding has been the practice on our buses masks are required and we have capacity caps for our buses um that's a quick attempt at an update subsequent to our submittal of this report rtd staff have been able to present to our board of directors more information regarding rtd's financial projections and financial reality so i want to just highlight a few numbers regarding our financial forecasts and um, our financial situation moving forward in, closure, in, in closing before I attempted to answer questions. And that is, as we discussed with our board of directors just last night, our projected deficit for 2021, RTD is projecting a $252 million deficit. That's based on a combination primarily of sales and use tax declines forecast for us by the CU Leeds School of Business, as well as um, declines in fare box revenue based on declining ridership and um, service levels. That $252 million deficit is about $135 million on our base system. That's the system um, of most of our buses and the uh, corridors that were in existence prior to fast tracks, as well as $117 million on the fast track side, just to provide a little more detail as to what that budget, that deficit looks like. $1.3 billion projected shortfall over the six year term of our 2021 through 2026, the six year term of our midterm financial plan, a $1.3 billion shortfall. So the CARES Act funding that RTD um, um, received earlier this year from the federal government 
is helping us weather the storm in 2020 and give it, and is frankly giving us time to figure out how to respond to these real, real world fiscal challenges um, where we do not project or CU leads does not project our sales and use tax levels returning to what they were last year until 2025, 2026 timeframe. With that chair, I finish my report. I know I, it went a little beyond just fast tracks, but I think it was relevant and important. Thank you, Director Van Meter. Just, just a housekeeping note. Are you going to add to your um, to your report on, uh, in committee reports, or is this going to conclude your report in totality tonight? My intent is for this report to supersede and supplant the subsequent report, and I do not intend to add anything at that time. Thank okay. you. Thank you, Director Van Meter. Uh, board members, any questions for Director Van Meter? If so, please raise your virtual hand. All right, thank you, Mr. Chair. This is Melinda. Uh, I'll just give uh, board members and alternates an opportunity to raise their hand. Okay, and uh, oh, it looks like we did have a hand go up. It looks like uh, Director Flynn has a question or comment. Yes, thank you. Bill, could you uh, uh, explain a little bit more about how long RTD might expect uh, the restrictions to take place on your vehicles? Uh, with the masks and with uh, limited capacity on buses and follow-up and and the use of follow-up buses on busy routes. Um, and also, if you could uh, talk about how you expect to enforce the mandatory mask rule, because there have been problems reported uh, with many businesses and other organizations trying to enforce that. Thanks. So in terms of the first part of the question, we do not have a good understanding or idea of when public health guidance from the Colorado Department of Public Health and the Environment, from the Centers for Disease Control, and from the American Public Transit Association, um, which are primary sources of, of guidance and information for the transit industry in the U.S. writ large, well, in the state for CDPHE, but in the U.S. writ large, um, when that policy on or their rec policy recommendations um, on spacing and social distancing on our vehicles may change. There have been some re recent press reports in the literature, in um, popular literature, and in industry literature indicating that transit systems worldwide have not been spreading COVID-19 at least anywhere near the levels that some people feared they might, which is um, a somewhat heartening thing for those practitioners such as myself who spent our career trying to encourage more people to ride transit and now um, have changed our tune and are almost almost attempting to discourage people from riding. So we don't know when the, when we'll be able to start loosening both mask requirement and social distancing requirement restrictions. We're um, playing it very careful and asking and expecting our passengers to be the primary responsible parties in terms of wearing masks. And um, anecdotally, we don't have any solid information, but anecdotally, we do have people out monitoring um, mask use amongst our passengers, and it's, um, it's very high. Uh, there's, a, there's a very good compliance rate, but we do have people riding at times without masks, and we are not attempting any stringent enforcement. Thank, thank you for letting us know that. Ms. Stevens, anybody else for Director Van Meter? 
Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. It looks like we do not have any other hands raised. Great. Uh, thank you, Ms. Stevens. Thank you, Director Van Meter. I appreciate your update. Thank you. Uh, the next item are committee reports. Uh, first report up is the State Transportation Advisory Committee. Director Jones, please. So Roger Partridge is going to give the report this um, week since I was on vacation for the last stack meeting. Thank you. Director Partridge. Thank you, Director Jones, and thank you for the wonderful picture. She, she deserved the time off she had. She's worked very hard on this. So, and I think Steve Cook did a wonderful job taking copious notes and for the uh, SAC. So to report the, the new data on the HUTF tax revenue as of yet, about a three minute a month of lag, maybe in July, we will know. There was action taken to approve use of toll credits for local match on federally funded projects. Regarding the multimodal options fund, 10 million was re re diverted from the general fund, but it will come out of the state portion. So the local multimodal options fund will not be impacted. Now that that's good, there's about 106 projects across the state looking for that funding. Several in Dr. Cog. The remaining four million will be allocated through the revitalized Main Street program, and communities can apply for this, especially for COVID-related COVID issues. And federal highways did approve some modifications for the roadways, and also noted that the fair market value fees for use of right-of-ways would be waived for this summer. So that's very good. Thank you, Federal Highways. The uh, legislative report was covered very well. One thing I didn't hear was the trans bond ballot issue that we heard may come up for 2020. Will not. It's possible it will come up in 2021. Uh, legislature also allocated, as we know, that did very well for seniors. And there will be $1 million for senior transportation services. See what CDOT will allocate those funds for agencies not covered by the CARES Act. There was a report from HPTE on the State Express Lanes Master Plan. And then last couple of things regarding the STEP, the Statewide Transportation Improvement Program, will go to the Transportation Commission next week. And then also the Statewide Transportation Plan and Statewide Transit Plan are out for public comment. That concludes the report. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Director Partridge. While we have you on the line, would you like to address the metro area county commissioners, or would you like uh, a moment to prepare your notes and I'll go into another report? Uh, sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair. We did not meet, so uh, we will also be taking the summer off. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you, Director Partridge. Uh, the next report is the Metro Mayor's Caucus. Usually, Director Atchison addresses this. If I may uh, indulge, uh, Director Starker. Uh, can you provide a report out on, on this, please? I'm <clears throat> happy to make a report in lieu of uh, Mayor Atchison. I will in no way try to uh, fill his sombrero. The uh, Metro mayors continue to meet on a weekly basis. Uh, our current meetings are focused on uh, opening strategies from the COVID uh, uh, pandemic and how we can incentivize our business nonprofits and our cities with the uh, CARES Act funding. We have also um, uh, had a, had a, a Zoom roundtable uh, last evening to discuss Senate Bill 217, the Enhanced Law Enforcement Integrity Bill, with um, about uh, 30 mayors, their city managers, and their police chiefs, and had a very productive uh, conversation. And that will conclude my report. Thank you, Director Starker. Uh, next report out is the Advisory Committee on Aging. Ms. Sanchez Warren, please. Hi, everyone. As we do with all things important in aging, we run it by our aging uh, Advisory Committee on Aging. We vetted the contracts uh, for transportation uh, and in-home services and voucher programs uh, that the Finance and Budget Committee passed uh, earlier this evening. I know we've talked about this a lot, but it was it was very concerning when SRC announced that they would not be providing transportation services. I was so worried about those folks that 
are going to dialysis and getting cancer treatments right now. Um, and I have been really uh, insistent that we not have a delay in, in, um, in, in a delay in service or, or that no, no appointments would be missed. And I think we're going to be able to accomplish that. Uh, it's only because of the work of 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 Dr. Cog. Um, Doug talked about uh, the the guys in transportation. Ron and Matthew um, did excellent work and couldn't have done it without them. Um, business and finance, uh, Travis and Sharon. Uh, but Doug didn't give himself any credit. And Doug was with me in the very early days of this, making calls with the state, talking to the governor staff, and he deserves a lot of credit as well. Um, so I think that's a, it's just a huge success. And I think it's, it's actually, we're not going to miss a trip. So that's great. We, we will report on that uh, after July or at our next meeting and see if we made it. Uh, Rich also gave an update on the uh, legislative issues, of, uh, primarily the cuts that AAA sustained in the long bill. That was very sad, but um, we had had um, the the money there, and had we not, because of rich efforts, we would have uh, lost program income, which we didn't. So we, our funding uh, is flat for next year, which is really a huge accomplishment in this day and age. So thanks to um, Rich and and our lobbying team, Ed and Jen. I also want to announce. I'm so excited about this that we have a new chair and vice chair of the Advisory Committee on Aging. Our new chair is Kathy Noon, former um, mayor of Centennial, former board member of Dr. Cog, and the winner of John B. Christensen Award. Uh, and then Carrie Erickson, who is the director of the Aging Resources of Douglas County. Um, these women are dynamic and have lots of great ideas. I am so looking forward to working with them in the next year. And that's my report. Thank you, Ms. San Sanchez Warren. Uh, next report out, the Regional Air Quality Council, Executive Director Rex. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just a couple things. We had a briefing on our 2020 modeling uh, for the serious uh, state implementation plan or SIP. Um, it's a chapter review on the modeling was was provided to us. Um, a presentation on this year's marketing campaign, Simple Steps Better Air, and uh, just an update on the ozone season thus far and uh, some committee reports. That's it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Executive Director Rex. Uh, next report out, E-470 Authority, Director Teal. Thanks, Chairman. Uh, the uh, E-470 uh, board directors did meet on June 11th uh, this month. Uh, really had six items on the agenda. Um, in that meeting, we had two uh, maintenance agreements that were on the consent calendar, followed by um, some good discussion about a Sable Interchange Feasibility Study. Um, this was a, a formal request submitted by the, town, the city of Brighton at the support of Adams County, and the board did approve, agree to um, and being a feasibility study to move the Sable interchange. Uh, we did uh, have a presentation about the master plan for 2020. Uh, staff presented a summary of major comments received and uh, the board did approve it. Information technology department did have a, um, well, in light of COVID, the IT department uh, has been holding off uh, hiring several staff members. In order to still provide the services, um, which are, is the way, um, um, you know, I, the, the authority relies heavily on its IT department in order to collect revenue and also issue, um, you know, tolling passes. Um, uh, the board approved the IT department to engage in a contract with Compre Consulting. It turns out that that actually brought the IT budget down. And um, we're going to look at um, the, the board of looked at approving, did approve uh, that contract. And until we get through the COVID crisis, that's really what happened at the uh, meeting before adjourning to an executive session and concludes my report, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Director Teal. Um, CDOT, Director White. 
Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, I think tonight I will focus on three pieces of good news um, from from our end, as there's been a enough bad news lately. Um, and and this involves these uh, three programs we're we're very excited about. One was mentioned earlier, uh, the uh, partnership program with Dr. Cog and CDOT to really address the safety issues we are seeing out on urban arterials, particularly for pedestrians and bicyclists. Many thanks to Chair Dyack for coming to our, our virtual Transportation Commission meeting in May and providing uh, the support of Dr. Cog for this program. The Commission did go ahead and move that the funding package forward. So right now we have a $50 million um, program that we will be kicking off here in early July. We're just working on kind of an announcement date. So we are incredibly excited at CDOT um, to get that program out, to partner with Dr. Cog in this really meaningful way and hopefully make um, a big difference in some of the fatalities and injuries we're seeing out there on our, our busiest streets. Uh, the, the second program um, we're also excited about, um, Executive Director Rex mentioned that Can Do Colorado was launched by the governor's office late last week. Um, to help businesses and communities sort of revitalize in the wake of Corona. Um, a part of that program is a, a grant um, out of CDOT that's um, meant to revitalize main streets. So that's $4 million that will be available. This is gonna be a rolling grant program. So we're just going to get applications in and award them as soon as we can so that we can get money out on the streets. We're looking at a, a $50,000 max award. So this is a, a small program, but it's meant to do things like help communities convert streets to one way, uh, expand sidewalks, um, other very quick items like that to really think about our spaces differently when it's um, going to be a time we're in for a while where being outdoors is much easier than being indoors in businesses. So that we should, uh, the notice of funding availability will be out, um, if not tomorrow, by Friday. Um, I'd appreciate um, any help getting the, the word out in the Dr. Cog community on that. And then we will pretty quickly follow with a mini grant program for TDM efforts um, to really try to encourage the momentum we've seen on working from home. And then the final piece of good news is outside the Dr. Cog area, um, but too good not to share. Um, Vail Pass is the, the bane of many of our existences during the winter. In fact, it closes um, an equivalent of 16 days a year uh, due to the weather conditions we face up there. However, today we received word that we got a $60 million grant from the Federal Highway Administration, an infra grant, that's gonna allow us to put um, some shoulders in there, an auxiliary lane, do some resurfacing um, and, and put in an automated highway closure system so we can better communicate with the traveling public um, when, that, when that road is closed for weather. So we are delighted um, to actually get some money in our uh, coffers when there's uh, so few resources to go around. So that's really good news. And that's it for me tonight. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Director White. Uh, the next section of the uh... Agenda informational items, item 12, Transportation Improvement Program Administrative Modifications. Uh, please take time uh, when available to review that. If any questions, please get with Mr. Cottrell. Uh, next item, administrative uh, items. Uh, item 13, our next meeting is July 15th. Uh, item 14, other matters by members. Are there any other Adam, uh, matters by members? Please raise your electronic hand. Ms. Stevens, please let me know if there are any additional matters. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll give everyone a moment. Okay, it looks like we do have uh, a comment from Sally Daigle. So, uh, Director Daigle, go ahead. Oh, hello, this is Sally. I just wanted to thank all of you that have been uh, involved in all of this and dealing with the COVID crisis. Um, you guys have done a really bang up job. Thank you so, so much. Um, RTD keeping buses running, Dr. Cobb uh, fighting for elderly and seniors. Um, I'm just really proud to be a part of all of it. Uh, the the stuff that we do here at Doc, Dr. Cog. It's amazing. And 
Um, I really do appreciate it. And sorry, I missed the last meeting. I'm an essential worker and was at work. So it's good to be back. And I, I really do appreciate all of the things that all of you have done. So thanks. Thank you, Director Daigle. And again, uh, I would echo that comment. Uh, to me as the chair, it's very easy to step into this role. Uh, a lot of things behind the scenes happen. Uh, and quite honestly, it is just, uh, it's yeoman's work on, on the staff side and uh, it, it just makes it oh so easy for us elected people to, uh, to do what we do. So thank you, Dr. Cox staff and CDOT staff and RTD staff. We appreciate it. Uh, Ms. Stevens, is, is anybody else? Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I do not see any other hands raised. Great. Mr. Chairman. Yes. If I may, this is Doug Rex. Uh, first of all, thank you all, both both of you all, for, for, for the kind comments. Um, I, I, I do have a matter. I, um, we are planning on having a July 1st work session. I just wanted to make sure the board is aware of that. Um, we will be getting, at minimum, a presentation from the Colorado Energy Office regarding um, House Bill 1261 that, that came through the legislature last year, and it, it involves um, uh, target setting for greenhouse gas emissions. And um, you know, over the coming months, the Air Quality Control Commission, as well as uh, CDPHE, will be making are developing strategies to help us mitigate and um, and meet those uh, those targets. And they are rather aggressive. So um, it. I think it would be a good opportunity for the board to learn a little bit more about 1261 and uh, and provide some comments and discussion with uh, CEO staff. So I just wanted to make sure everybody was aware. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Executive Director Rex. Um, with no other matters before the board, I will adjourn the meeting at 7.52. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Good night, good night everyone. Thank night, you. Everyone. Bye, everyone. Be safe.